Hi there, welcome back. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to continue and talk about chapter five. So, um, still with cell structure and function, but now we're looking more at membrane structure and function and transport into and out of the membrane. So let's take a look at the membrane. I'm just going to move myself out of the picture so that we're not um, filling up the screen with my little picture. So looking at the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, that is kind of the boundary that separates the living cell from its surroundings. And so we're made up of mostly water inside and outside of the cell. And we've got the plasma membrane that separates the inside from the outside. And that membrane is going to be selectively permeable, which means some things can enter the cell and some things cannot. And so some things are going to be easier to get into and out of the cell than others. So the cell membrane is a fluid mosaic of lipids and proteins. And so it is made up of mostly phospholipids. And so that's gonna be the most abundant lipid in the plasma membrane. It's not the only molecule there, but it makes up the, the majority of that membrane. And phospholipids are what we call amphiphatic molecules, which means they have a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region. And in our last unit, we talked a little bit about that, that structure. So we're going to look at that a little bit closer in this one. And the cell membrane is said to be a fluid mosaic model. What that means is a mosaic is going to be, uh, typically it's a, a art, um, an artistic rendering that's made up of a whole lot of little things that make a bigger picture. And so the cell membrane is, is similar to that. It is made up of a whole bunch of phospholipids with things embedded in it that makes up the overall structure of the membrane. So if we look first at that phospholipid, it is a phospholipid bilayer. And so it's two layers. And so you can see here in our diagram, we've got a, a layer on top and we've got a layer on the bottom. And again, the cell is made up of mostly water. So we've got water inside the cell, we've got water outside the cell. So it's a very aqueous environment. But the phospholipid has an area that is hydro phobic and an area that is hydrophilic. And so the hydrophilic end of the molecule where the phosphate group is located, that's going to like water. And so it will face the water and be comfortable facing that water. And inside the cell, same thing. We've got the hydrophilic head facing inside where there's water and outside where there's water. The hydrophobic tails, though, they don't like the water and they're going to do whatever they can to get away from the water. And so they're going to face each other because these phospholipids on this layer like to hang out with these phospholipids on that layer. So they're going to get away from the water, but they're going to hang out together because they are similar. So those hydrophobic tails will kind of cluster and clump together. And that's what forms that, that bilayer. So inside we've got this hydrophobic tail region, and then we've got a hydrophilic head region facing the outside and the inside of the cell. So it's a bilayer because we've got two layers of those phospholipids. And originally, scientists knew that cell membranes were made up of phospholipids and proteins, but they didn't really know exactly the structure. So in 1935, Davison and Dinelli proposed kind of a sandwich model, and they believed that the phospholipids were in between layers of globular proteins. But later studies kind of found that that wasn't quite right. And so in 1972, Singer and Nicholson proposed what is now believed to be the correct structure of the membrane, which is the fluid mosaic model. And so here's the, the picture showing you the Davison-Dinelli model on the left, 
which we now know is not correct. And then the Singer-Nicholson model on the right, and that is the correct structure of the cell membrane. We now have better ways of imaging the cell membrane and, and verifying the structure. Um, but originally, the Davison and Dinelli model is what they believed the membrane was like. So um, it again is a fluid mosaic model, mosaic because it's made up of all of those different components to make the overall structure. Um, but it's fluid because those molecules, those structures can move. And so that's the fluidity of it. And so we now know that it is that fluid mosaic model because scientists can do a technique called freeze fracture. And what freeze fracture is, is they're basically freezing the cell and they're ripping it apart between that phospholipid bilayer. So when they freeze it and it kind of separates the, the bilayer, we can see that in that bilayer are those embedded proteins. And so using freeze fracture technique, they can kind of tell that the proteins are embedded in the membrane, not above and below the membrane. So freeze fracture technique is just a way of verifying that fluid mosaic model. And then again, it's fluid in the fact that those molecules can move around. Those lipids, they're not stuck in place. The lipids and the proteins, they kind of drift mostly laterally. So side by side, they're, sw they're swapping locations with each other. But occasionally, very rarely, they can also flip-flop transversely across the membrane. So if we look at this next picture here, so most of the time they're just moving around, bobbing around. So if you imagine a swimming pool filled with ping pong balls, they're going to float on the surface and those ping pong balls are just going to move around on the surface of the cell. Now you could also throw some beach balls in there. That would be like the proteins. They're also going to bob around as the wind blows. They're going to move past each other. And so that's the fluidity of the membrane. Those phospholipids are kind of bobbing around in that surface, just like they are in the cell or in the swimming pool. Um, those little balls floating in the swimming pool. Um, Rarely they can flip flop from one side to the other, but that's not as likely because again, the, the hydrophobic, hydrophilic regions, they don't really like to move across that, but occasionally that does happen. But typically they're just moving laterally side by side. And scientists, of course, have tested this. And so what they have done is in an experiment, they've taken a cell, a mouse cell that has obviously mouse proteins embedded in that membrane. And you can merge that membrane with another cell. And so they've merged it with a human cell and well, which obviously has human proteins in it. And when you do that, when you merge them together, after a period of time, those proteins are now kind of all intermixed. So you started out with your mouse proteins up here on the top and the, the human proteins down on the bottom. And then after time, you can see that now they are kind of interdispersed and they've all moved around after an hour or so, those proteins are no longer in that same original location. So that kind of lets you know that those proteins are moving and they're not stuck in place. And so that's the fluidity of the cell, the cell membrane. Okay. And the fluidity of the membrane, just like all molecules, is going to be affected by the temperature. So as the temperature gets colder, those molecules are going to move less. So they're going to slow down. Um, higher temperatures, they're going to move faster. And so there are temperatures at which the membrane um, could solidify and that's going to be bad if it's, if it's a solid structure it's not going to allow things to get into and out of the cell and so some cell membranes are going to be more fluid than others and that's going to depend on the saturated fats or unsaturated fats 
or phospholipids, the fatty acid tails that are in that membrane. So if you remember when we talked about saturated fats and unsaturated fats, um, same thing kind of goes for the cell membrane as well. And so if we look at um, this diagram up here, the, the one up here on the left says fluid. And so those are going to have unsaturated hydrocarbon tails. So those phospholipids, um, the tails, are going to have kinks in them. And those, those kinks are going to, just like an unsaturated fat, they're going to have some more space between them. And so that membrane is going to be more fluid, just like unsaturated fats are going to be fluid at room temperature in a cell if they have those kinks in the chain they're going to be more fluid because they can move past each other if they are primarily saturated hydrocarbon tails they're going to pack closer together and so they're going to be less fluid more viscous so um, moving less when they are saturated with the hydrocarbons. Um, and so at different temperatures, again, the, um, the fluidity is going to affect the movement of them. And so we have a steroid called cholesterol that will have different effects on that membrane at different temperatures. So it's going to be embedded in the membrane. So if we look at this picture down here at the bottom, these four ring structures, those are cholesterols and they're embedded in the membrane. And that's going to have an effect on the fluidity of the membrane. And whether it's a cold temperature or a hot temperature is going to affect it differently. So at warm temperatures, such as 37 degrees Celsius, cholesterol is going to restrain the movement of the phospholipid. So it's going to prevent it from being too fluid at high temperatures when molecules are, are moving fast. And at cold temperatures, it's also going to maintain the fluidity by preventing those phospholipids from packing too tightly. So it allows the membrane to maintain fluidity at both high and low temperatures. So it kind of prevents it from moving too much when it's hot and prevents it from moving too slow when it's cold. So cholesterol, it plays an important role in the membrane in the fact that it helps maintain the fluidity. And the fluidity is important for movement across the membrane, getting molecules into and out of the cell. And then, of course, with the phospholipid um, bilayer, we also have membrane proteins embedded in it. So again, that fluid mosaic model with those proteins. And they're going to have lots of different functions for all of those membranes, um, membrane proteins. So it's going to be a collage of different proteins that are embedded in that matrix. And that will help with the different functions for that particular cell. So the membrane proteins will kind of determine the membrane's specific functions. And so here you can see a picture of the cell membrane. And so you've got your phospholipid bilayer. You can see your, your cholesterol molecules embedded in there. And then we've got proteins embedded in there. Some of those proteins are going to go all the way through. And so those are going to be um, integral proteins because they kind of go into the cell membrane. So those proteins are actually going to have regions that are hydrophobic that will kind of hang out with these hydrophobic tails. And then there are going to be some proteins that are kind of on the edge or the outside. And so those are going to be your peripheral protein. So they don't go into where the tails are. They're kind of embedded in where the um, the heads of the phospholipids are. So we've got integral proteins going into the membrane, and then we've got peripheral proteins that are on the periphery or the outside. Okay, so again, a peripheral protein are going to be bound to the surface of the membrane, and then integral proteins are going to be the ones that penetrate the hydrophobic 
four. And then a transmembrane protein is going to be a type of integral protein that will span the entire membrane of the, the protein or the entire, span the entire membrane. Okay, so when we're looking at those integral proteins, when the protein is folded up, in order for it to be able to kind of hang out with all these tails, this region of the protein needs to be hydrophobic. And then of course, the part that's on the inside or the outside where there's water, those are going to be um, polar regions of that protein. We get all our energy and organic molecules from food. Before we can use the molecules we eat, they have to enter our cells, starting with the cells lining the small intestine. Let's zoom in to the surface of a cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids, such as these yellow molecules, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer. Notice how they move down their concentration gradient from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This is an example of diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell. Most molecules can't pass the lipid bilayer. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell, so it's also a form of passive transport. What crosses the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion? Or by diffusing across the lipid bilayer directly? The diffusion of water across the membrane is called osmosis. Sodium potassium pump. Another type of active transport is co-transport. Here, both sodium ions and glucose move into the cell through a co-transporter protein. Sodium ions move down the concentration gradient created by the sodium potassium pump, and glucose moves against its concentration gradient. Now let's move to the other side of our intestinal cell. Materials can be exported from vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents outside the cell. This process is part of the exosynthesis. The plasma membrane pinches in, forming a vesicle that contains material from outside the cell. On this side of the cell, we can also see oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing across the lipid bilayer. to get what we need. So again, there are proteins embedded in the membrane and they're all going to have functions. There are lots of different functions for those membrane proteins. So we've got some that are transport, enzymatic, signal transduction, cell to cell um, recognition, intracellular joining, um, and then the extracellular matrix and the cytoskeleton proteins.
So transport ones are going to be moving things into and out of the cells, and we're going to take a closer look at those in this chapter. Some of them work as enzymatic, and when we talk about cell energy, we'll talk about more of those enzymes and enzymatic proteins. Some of them work with signal transduction. So in our cell communication unit, we'll talk a lot more about those. Cell to cell recognition. Again, in our cell communication unit, we'll, we'll touch on those again. And then intracellular joining helps to connect cells that are next to each other. So cells that are in the same tissue type might be joined together. And then attachment to the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. Um, so it helps, again, hold the proteins together or the cells together. And so they're going to be helping with attaching proteins inside, outside the cell. So lots of different functions for those cells that are, um, sorry, those proteins that are in the cell membrane. So when we're looking at cell to cell recognition, there are some carbohydrates in the membrane that also help with that. And so when we take a look at that, the membrane carbohydrates might be covalently bonded to the lipids. So if they are bonded to the lipids, the phospholipids, um, they're going to form glycolipids. Or more commonly, um, if they're bound, um, covalently bound to the proteins, then they're going to form glycoproteins. So glycolipids and glycoproteins are carbohydrates that are attached to the cell membrane. So if they're attached onto the lipids, the phospholipids, then they're going to form glycolipids. If they're attached to the proteins, they're glycoproteins. So the carbohydrates on the external side of the plasma membrane are going to vary among species. So they're going to be different from species to species and individual and even cell types in an individual. Um, so they all help with cell recognition um, from one um one cell to another. And so when we look at some viruses, those are going to attach on to those membrane um, receptors. So whether you're looking at HIV or COVID, there are receptor proteins that those viruses will attach onto that then kind of recognize those particular types of cells and then can infect the, those body cells. And so some viruses will attach onto those receptors. And when we get to cell communication, we'll talk a lot more about those um, receptor proteins as well that are on the surface of the cell. So it's not just viruses that will attach onto them. There are other cell signals that will attach onto those membrane proteins as well. Um, so when we look at this, the membrane and the synthesis of the membrane, there's obviously an inside and an outside of the cell membrane. And that's going to be determined by the endoplasmic reticulum in the Golgi apparatus and how they're making the proteins. They're going to, again, embed them into the membrane of the vesicles that are going to get shipped to the membrane. So if we take a look at that, um, protein synthesis for a protein that's going to end up in the membrane, that's going to be produced by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the ribosomes will then produce a protein that goes into the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the endoplasmic reticulum is going to kind of embed those proteins in the, the membrane of the vesicle that then gets shipped to the Golgi, which then gets shipped out to the membrane. And then if it's embedded in the membrane of the vesicle, what is in that vesicle on the inside is going to become the outside of the cell membrane. So this vesicle will merge with the cell membrane and the membrane of the vesicle will become part of the cell membrane. So whatever protein is in that vesicle will then be in 
the cell membrane. So if it is a protein that needs to be on the surface of the cell, it's going to be facing the inside of that vesicle. So when it merges with the cell membrane, it can be on the outside of the cell. Um, so those proteins will then be placed where they need to be by the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. So then when they merge, they're in the right orientation for the cell. And again, the cell membrane's job is to exchange materials with the surrounding, so moving things into and out of the cell. And the cell membrane is selectively permeable, so regulating the molecular traffic. And the permeability of that lipid bilayer is going to um, determine what can cross it and what can't cross it. So molecules that are hydrophobic, so nonpolar molecules that can dissolve in lipid is going to be able to move through that membrane easily. So if it is nonpolar, then those hydrophobic nonpolar tails of the phospholipid will let them pass through. So you can think of that phospholipid bilayer as a hydrophobic club and kind of a barrier that you need to get through. And so if you are hydrophobic and nonpolar, then you can get through that club. The club will let you in, you can hang out there, you can pass through it. So the hydrophobic molecules will be able to move through the hydrophobic tails easily. And so those lipid molecules can pass through the membrane easily. But molecules that have any kind of charge, polar molecules, ions, are not going to be able to get into and out of the cell very easily. So they're going to need assistance to get in. So the polar molecules will not be able to get through that hydrophobic region. Um, so they'll, they'll be fine inside and outside the cell, but they can't pass through the membrane because the tails are hydrophobic and will not let the polar molecules in. So they do not pass through easily through that membrane. So they're going to need some assistance getting in. And so we have transport proteins that will help allow molecules to get into and out of the cell. And so we've got um, transport proteins and there's different types of transport proteins. Um, channel proteins kind of are like a channel or a tunnel to get into the cell. And so they will, um, molecules can then pass through those channel proteins. And so there are certain proteins that will be channel proteins embedded in the membrane to allow molecules to pass through. An aquaporin is a channel protein that allows water to pass through the cell membrane. So water is teeny tiny and some of the water can squeeze through the membrane. So it can pass through because it's small enough to kind of sneak its way in. But um, there are aquaporins that allow water to move through into and out of the cell easier. So aquaporins are channel proteins for water to pass into and out of the cell um, more rapidly. And then we also, so those are, um, channel proteins are kind of like tunnels. Um, but there are also carrier proteins that will transport molecules into the cell, but they're going to bind to the protein. Those molecules will bind to the carrier protein, and then it carries it into the cell by changing the shape and kind of shuttling them across the membrane. And those are going to be very specific because they have to bind to those proteins to bring them into the membrane. So the top diagram here is showing you a channel protein, so kind of like a tunnel, allowing those molecules to flow in. And then a carrier protein, you can see on the bottom, the molecule will bind, and then that causes that protein to change shape, and then it shuttles it to the inside of the cell. So when we look at movement across the cell membrane, um, we're looking at diffusion and that's going to be passive transport. So passive transport is going to be diffusion of a substance across the membrane where there's no energy invested in that movement. 
And so what that means is anytime you've got molecules that are tightly packed together, they're going to tend to spread out evenly into that available space. And so when we're looking at diffusion in general, let's say I spray some perfume that is going to be highly concentrated, eventually I'm going to start smelling it in different locations because those perfume molecules are going to spread out into the available space. And then the same thing happens in your cells. And so molecules can diffuse across the membrane um, and they're going to diffuse from where you've got a high concentration to where there is a low concentration until it's evenly distributed throughout. Um, and that's a dynamic equilibrium will develop where it's equally distributed inside and outside of the cell. So that's kind of the goal is to get um, those molecules to spread out evenly. And it's dynamic equilibrium because the molecules are going to keep moving back and forth across the membrane, even when it's evenly distributed across that membrane. So here you can set, see in the top diagram on the left, you've got a whole bunch of dye molecules on the left and none on the right. And they can pass through that membrane. So they're going to kind of move back and forth across until they're evenly distributed. But then they're going to keep moving back and forth. And so that's dynamic equilibrium. The molecules continuously moving back and forth, but keeping about equal amounts on each side of the membrane. Um, and then if you had two different molecules, again, the same thing's going to happen. They're going to evenly distribute throughout until they're evenly distributed on both sides. So at the bottom, you've got the orange and the purple. The orange is going to diffuse until it's evenly distributed, and same with the purple. And so you're going to have equal amounts in the end on both sides. So passive transport is substances moving down their concentration gradient. So when we say down the concentration gradient, what we mean is moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And then again, until they are evenly distributed. And there's no work being done, and so it doesn't require any energy. Okay, so passive transport, high concentration to low concentration, and no energy is needed for that. Osmosis is a type of diffusion, but we're looking specifically at water diffusing across a membrane. And so osmosis is going to be the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane, like the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. Okay, so here, if we look at this U2, you've got a selectively permeable barrier here, like the cell membrane. And we've got a high concentration of sugar molecules on this side and a low concentration of sugar molecules on that side. Because the sugar cannot pass through that membrane, what's going to happen is the water is going to move because the water can move through that membrane. And so it's going to move so that it is evenly distributed on both sides. And so the water is going to move from where it's in high concentration to where it's in low concentration. So it's going to move to the left and the sugar is going to stay put. And then so at the end, you've got even amounts of water on both sides and therefore also even amounts of sugar. And so that is osmosis. And when we look at the movement of water across the cells, we need to take a look at tonicity. So tonicity is gonna be the ability of a surrounding solution to cause the cell to gain or lose water. So when we're talking about tonicity, we're talking about where the water is going in relationship to the cell membrane. So either in or out or in and out equally. 
So the easiest one to, to understand is an isotonic solution. That's going to be when you have the same concentration inside the cell as you do outside. So then there's going to be no net water movement across the membrane, which means the water is going to be moving equally in and out of the cell. So you're going to have um, the water is the same amount inside and outside. A hypertonic solution is the solute concentration is greater than that inside the cell. And so the cell is going to lose water. So it's going to cause the water, um, the cell to shrivel up. And then a hypotonic solution, the solute concentration is less than that inside the cell and the cell gains water. So if we look at that in another diagram here, if you're looking at an animal cell that just has a cell membrane, not a cell wall, in an isotonic solution, you can see equal amounts of water going in and out. And for an animal cell, that is the normal condition, is an isotonic solution. So if you have a hypertonic solution, so if you think of the, the prefix hyper, that means lots of. And so if you've got lots of stuff outside of the cell, that means there's very little water. And the water is going to move from where it's in high concentration to where it's in low concentration. So it's going to come out of the cell. So there's very little water, so the water is going to come out. And that's a hypertonic solution causing the cell to shrivel up. In a hypotonic solution, like pure water, that means that there's more water outside the cell than inside the cell, so the water is going to move into the cell. So think of pure water, and if you think of a cell, cells are made up of about 70 to 90 percent water, so that's a lot of water. But it's not pure water. There's other stuff in the cell. There's organelles. There's stuff dissolved in there. So it's not pure water inside the cell. There is certainly a lot of water in there, but not pure water. So if it's in pure water, the water is going to go from high concentration to low concentration. So it's going to move into the cell. So you can think of it like Hypo, hippo, the cell is going to swell up like a hippo in a hypotonic solution. So hypotonic in pure water in an animal cell, because the water is moving into the cell, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the cell membrane. And if too much water goes in, it could burst. And if it bursts or breaks open, that's said to have lysed. So lysing is the bursting or breaking of a cell. Plant cells are a little bit different because they have that cell wall and that cell wall is rigid. Um, what will happen in a normal situation for plants, they want that pressure in the cell. So the water is going to, in a hypotonic solution, it also is going to move into the cell. But because they have that rigid cell wall, it's not going to burst. And so that's actually the normal condition for a plant cell. And that's said to be turgid. And so that kind of gives that cell rigidity and um, structure. So normally plants like to be in that pure water. If a cell starts to lose plant cell starts to lose water. So if it's in an isotonic solution, it will actually lose water. And that's said to be flaccid in an isotonic solution. So water is moving into and out of it equally, but um, that's said to be flaccid. And so it's going to kind of start to wilt. When, when you see a plant starting to wilt, um, it's probably in an isotonic solution. And if it loses too much water, if you're putting it in a hypertonic solution, causing the water to leave, what will happen is if too much water loses, leaves and it loses too much water, then that could actually cause the cell uh, membrane to rip away from the cell wall. And when that happens, it's said to have plasmalized. 
And that could actually lead to the death of the cell if the cell membrane comes off of the cell wall. So a hypertonic solution, shriveling of that cell inside the cell wall um, is bad for the plant cell. Okay, so those are your hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic solutions. Osmoregulation is the ability of organisms to control the solute concentration and water balance. And so organisms that live in aquatic ecosystems, they need to be able to maintain that osmoregulation. They need to maintain their water balance inside the cell. Um, and protists called paramecium, um, they're going to live in the pond water, which is... Um, the inside the cell is hypertonic to its watery environment. So it's in pure water and that's going to cause that cell normally to gain water. So it's a hypotonic solution, that freshwater environment. And so what it has is it has a contractile vacuole that will actually pump the extra water back out to keep it in the right balance. So it needs to have water, but it doesn't want to have too much that it can cause the cell to explode. So the paramecium actually has an adaptation, um, contractile vacuole that can pump out that extra water. The membrane is permeable to water molecules and allows the movement of water into and out of the cells, which is critical to life. Of water molecules across the selective membrane is a special kind of passive transport called osmosis. If a membrane is permeable to water, what happens in the solute and not the rest of the membrane? hypertonic solution, the concentration of free water molecules is higher on the inside of the cell than the outside. Osmosis occurs as water molecules move down their concentration rate, leaving the cell. As a result, here's another scenario. Solution: The concentration of free water molecules is higher on the outside of the cell than the inside. Cells are exposed to a hypertonic membrane. Water rushes into the cell and sucks 
for all the physiological functions while the chemistry of the state. Once I returned to an isotonic or hydrogenic environment, water re enters the cell and has normal functioning, being restored. Since plant cells are surrounded by rigid cell walls, when plant cells are exposed to a hydrogenic environment, the water runs out of the cell and the plants remembering the history of the cell wall and multiple places. Okay, here's just showing you a paramecium. There's a contractile vacuole in the middle and pumping out the excess water because it lives in a um, a pure water environment. So again, for the plant cells in a hypotonic solution, that is the normal state. And so that's said to be turgid or firm. So it gives that, that cell nice strength and structure. Um, flaccid is when it is in an isotonic solution. Um, so it's starting to, to wilt. And then a hypertonic solution, it's losing too much water that's pulling the cell membrane away from the wall, which can be lethal for the cell. Um, and that's plasmolysis of the plant cell. Okay, so again, looking at those channel proteins um, and facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is when molecules need assistance getting into the cell, so movement across the cell. So channel proteins are going to provide that corridor that allows specific molecules or ions to cross the membrane. And channel proteins are going to include aquaporins. So aquaporins are going to be channel proteins for the diffusion of water, allowing um, larger quantities of water to get into the cell. But there are also ion channels. So ions are going to be molecules that have a, a charge, positive or negative charge. And they're definitely not getting through that um, phospholipid bilayer that hydrophobic region. So they definitely need a transport mechanism to get them into the cell. And so ion channels are going to open and close in response to a stimulus, and they're typically called gated ion channels. Um, and so they're going to allow molecules, ions to travel into the cell. And when we get to cell communication and sending signals like in the, um, in the nervous system, we'll talk a little bit more about ion channels um, again. And then of course, the carrier proteins, again, they're going to change shape to move those molecules into and out of the cell. And some diseases are caused by malfunctions in these specific transport proteins. Um, for example, kidney disease would be one example of um, a defective protein that's in the membrane. So again, channel proteins allow the flow of certain molecules into the cell, kind of like through a tunnel, and carrier proteins will transform um, and change shape when they are transporting those molecules into the cell. So that's passive transport. They're going, again, from high concentration to low concentration. And so passive transport does not require any energy because it's going from high concentration to low concentration. When we look at active transport, active transport is going to require energy because you're moving against a concentration gradient. So you're going from low concentration to high concentration instead of high to low. And that's why it requires energy. You're going against that concentration gradient. Um, and so those active transport proteins are going from low concentration to high. And you can think of it like your sock drawer. Um, if you are, your sock drawer is already full of socks and you have to shove, you just did laundry and you have to shove some more socks into that sock drawer, it's going to take some energy to actually get those socks to get into the drawer. 
And so you're going from low concentration to high concentration. That's going to require energy, stuffing those extra socks into that sock drawer. But let's imagine you've got a big, huge closet. You've shoved all your stuff in. You had company and you shoved a whole bunch of stuff in there. And when you open the closet door, things are just going to fall out because they're going from high concentration to low concentration. So that's passive transport. Um, when you're going from high concentration to low, things will just kind of fall out on their own. Um, and that doesn't require energy. But active transport is going against that concentration gradient. And so it does require energy. Usually that energy is in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And so that's the energy source typically used in the cells. An example of active transport is a sodium potassium pump. And the sodium potassium pump plays an important role in many cells, especially the nervous system. But a lot of, of cells re require that sodium potassium pump. And what the sodium potassium pump will do is um, when you're you're going against that concentration gradient. So in the in looking in this diagram here. Outside of the cell, we have high quantities of sodium and low quantities of potassium and vice versa um, on the inside of the cell. So we're going from low concentration to high concentration. So we've got low sodium inside and high sodium outside, and we're pumping more sodium outside of the cell. And um, so that's going to require ATP energy, and that's going to activate that sodium potassium pump. So the sodium will enter that pump. ATP will activate it, which will then cause it to change shape, releasing the sodium on the outside of the cell where you already have a lot of sodium. And then the potassium will enter into that sodium potassium pump and it will change shape back, releasing the potassium inside the cell where there is already a lot of potassium. And so that, um, that whole process is pumping the sodium out and the potassium in, both of which is going against the concentration gradient, which requires ATP energy. <clears throat> Sometimes a cell needs to move a cell against its concentration gradient. This process is called active transport, and it requires input of energy from ATP. For instance, most animal cells need to expel sodium ions and ions and take in potassium ions and P plus, both against their concentration gradients. Here's how the sodium potassium pump works. Sodium ions bond to a transport protein. ATP transfers a phosphate group to the protein, providing the energy that causes the protein to change shape, and then move the sodium ions across the membrane where they are released outside the cell. Okay, so this diagram kind of sums up that process. So diffusion is going to be molecules moving from high concentration to low concentration across the membrane. Those are going directly through the phospholipid bilayer. And molecules like water can pass through the membrane because they're teeny tiny. Other things like oxygen and carbon dioxide they can also squeeze through the membrane because they're teeny tiny. They can pass through the membrane. So they're kind of sneaking through. So water, even though it is polar, can squeeze through because it's teeny tiny. And so it can sneak through. But that's why we also have the aquaporins to allow them to flow through freely. So small, small molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, water will pass through the membrane and will typically diffuse across from high concentration to low concentration. 
So not requir requiring any energy. And so that's diffusion. Also passive transport through channel and carrier proteins. Those are again, moving from high concentration to low concentration, not requiring any energy. So passive transport is going to be both diffusion and facilitated diffusion because you're going from high concentration to low concentration. So you're going down that concentration gradient, um, but facilitated diffusion, you're using a protein to assist in getting those molecules into the cell. Simple diffusion or just diffusion is going directly through that cell membrane. An active transport is going against the concentration gradient. And because you're going against the concentration gradient, it's going to require ATP energy in order to do that. So active transport requires energy because you're going against the concentration gradient. Okay. And when we look at ions, that's where membrane potential comes in. And so membrane potential is going to be the voltage difference across a membrane. And so that's going to be the positive negative ions that are inside and outside of the cell. And that can create an electrochemical gradient. And that can dr drive diffusion of ions across the membrane. And this is going to be important in the nervous system sending signals down that um, axon when you're sending a, a, nervous si a nerve signal. Um, so it is a chemical force, the ion gradient, um, that can drive that that membrane potential and the ion movement. So an electrogenic pump is gonna be a transport protein that's gonna generate voltage across the membrane. And then um, sodium potassium pumps are kind of an example of that, moving those um, charged molecules into and out of the cell. A proton pump is another example of an, an ion pump that's pumping molecules into or out of the cell. So here is a, a proton pump. It is moving hydrogen ions from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And that's going to require energy as well because you're pumping those ions across the membrane. And co-transport sometimes will occur. And what co-transport is, is when you've got active transport of a solute is going to drive the transport of other solutes in, either into or out of the cell. And plants commonly use the gradient of the hydrogen ions generated by proton pumps to drive active transport of nutrients into the cell. So here's an example. So here's a proton pump pumping hydrogen ions out of the cell. And that, of course, uses ATP energy. But then the hydrogen ions are going to want to flow back through. And so we've got a co-transporter that is pumping the hydrogen ions back in. But while it's doing that, it's pumping the sucrose in. So a co-transporter is kind of doubling up on a, a, a protein that's working to, to facilitate movement of molecules into the cell. So that's active and passive transport. Then the last thing that we need to talk about is bulk transport across the membrane. So bulk transport is going to be moving large molecules into or out of the cell. And so, Sometimes we need to get those larger molecules in and bulk transport, because it requires movement of the membrane, that is going to require energy. And so you're moving large molecules such as polysaccharides or proteins across the membrane, and we're using vesicles to do that. So if we're moving molecules, large molecules out of the cell, that's going to be exocytosis. So think of exiting. Exiting the cell is going to be when a vesicle that contains something, 
to be removed from the cell. It, that vesicle is going to merge with the cell membrane. It's going to fuse and spill out, releasing its contents to the, the outside of the cell. And so many secretory cells are going to use exocytosis to get their products, those proteins, out to secrete out of the cell. And then endocytosis is basically the opposite, taking in macromolecules by forming an indentation in the cell membrane, which forms a vesicle that can then move molecules into the cell. And looking at endocytosis, bringing things into the cell, there are three types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So phagocytosis is going to be bringing large molecules into the cell, large objects, and it's going to, the, that vacuole will um, fuse with a lysosome, which will then kind of digest it inside of the cell. So um, let's see if there's a picture. Here we go. Here's your phagocytosis. So here's a large um, food particle or object that's coming in. And so the cell membrane, the, the membrane kind of surrounds it and brings it in. So kind of like a blob surrounding it and pinching off and forming a little vesicle inside. And then that vesicle can merge with digestive enzymes to break down those food particles and such inside the cell. And then pinocytosis is similar, except you're taking in smaller vesicles. So kind of like taking a little gulp um, in bringing it into the cell. And so if we look at this middle picture here, these smaller molecules are being pinched off and brought into the vesicle. So it's thought of like more like drinking instead of eating, bringing in a little gulp into the cell, into that little vesicle. And then the third kind is receptor mediated endocytosis where there is a receptor protein on the cell membrane that will bind to a molecule. And then that will then bring that specific molecule into the cell called a ligand. And so here you can see those red molecules um, are on the surface and they will attach the molecules that need to come into the cell, which are the little purple triangles. And so um, it pinches off and brings in a very specific molecule. So it's kind of like a lock and key, bringing in that specific molecule into the cell. All of those require energy because the cell membrane is moving and the cytoskeleton needs to move to do that. And that all requires energy for the cell. is the movement of materials into a cell in a vesicles that form from the plasma membrane. Exocytosis, I don't know what to do, but I don't know what to do. 
Phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Receptor mediated endocytosis is very specific. It's triggered that every receptors bind to specific external molecules, such as protein, cholesterol, or toxins, or proteins bound to iron. Every receptor is neutral. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So again, to sum up, passive transport is diffusion and facilitated diffusion going from high concentration to low concentration against the membrane um, or down that the concentration gradient across the membrane. Active transport is requiring energy because you're going against the concentration gradient. And active transport um, also includes bulk transport, so that requires energy as well. Okay. I hope that was helpful, and um, we'll see you next time.